Hello, everybody. Time is now three o'clock where I am. Maybe it's earlier where you are, maybe it's later. And welcome so much to the NeuroCell, uh, the science behind how actually to influence and how actually do impact on your sales results, not only on the brain of the customer, but also on your own brain. For those who don't know me, I'm Matt Winder. I'm so happy to see you. Some of you participated maybe my earlier seminars or webinars about their neuroscience. Some of you didn't. And for each of you, there'll be plenty of stuff uh, for, for joining, uh, the reason for joining today and, and for learning. So I hope that after this session today, you got inspired, you got uh, tools, and you got actually some knowledge about how you can make even better results in your job in selling. But just to start very fast, what we will do is we will start seeing if you are ready to do this session. It's a kind of a test or a pass. No, it's not. Just fun. So what I'd like you to do is to all of you get ready with, uh, with uh, a piece of uh, paper and a pen. And then I'll tell you a short story and I'll give you a small task. And I hope you can do it. And I'll also ask you to please type it in the chat to see what happened here. This is a very easy exercise. And a easy story I want to tell you is, I think we all know when you're living in big cities, driving around is sometimes a terrible mess. Uh, you lose a lot of time and what happens is uh, you get a little frustrated. In this session here, I would like to take you on a small travel going from A to B. A to B is a normal distance to go wherever you're joining with your company, you need to move it or your sales or yourself. A to B is actually going here from A to B. And what I'm gonna tell you now is I give you a little stack of information. The information is that when you drive from A to B, that distance can be any distance here, but driving from A to B, what is interesting here is that my average speed going out is 60 kilometers an hour. That actually means I'm able of driving 60 kilometers an average. It might have been higher, it might have been lower, but in average, it was 60. When I reach my turning point here, B, I turn, and then I drive directly the same route going back. Nothing happened. I just drive going back exactly the same route, unless something did happen, meaning that my speed got lower. I was only driving 60, sorry, 30 kilometers an hour. So what actually happened here, there might be more traffic, I might be more tired, something happened, 60 going out, 30 going back. And remember, it is exactly the same route. Now my question to you is, this Monday, my easy question to you is, if I have been driving 60 going out, 30 going back, what is my average speed? What is my average speed? Please put in the chat, what is the average speed here so we can hear that. Please put it in the chat. What do you think is the average speed? I see somebody's putting in average speed now, really great. And I think you're all putting in good figures here. It's an easy calculation to do that early in the week, Monday, the first day for most of us, for some it might be the second day or whatever. So actually, I think that people put in 45 here. That's pretty interesting because, yeah, I like what you're putting in. Let's go to a little solution here. I think somebody, a lot actually, is putting in 45 as their number. That's quite funny because somebody is also maybe writing that I need more information. This is just like selling. I sometimes need more information. What is happening now is, I can give you a little more information because an average speed, it depended on two things, distance and time. And what I give you now, and please remember, keep your brain with me because what happened now is that your brain goes very fast to conclusions. That's actually one of the exercises here. I give you now one information telling you that going from A to B is a distance of 60 kilometers. So what do we know? Take it easy now, stay with me, please. What we know is exactly that it takes one hour to go from A to B. What else do we know? And don't jump to conclusions. We know for sure, going back 
is also 60 kilometers. And then we know it will probably with 30 kilometers an hour, it will take us two hours to go back. So what we know is now that I've been driving 120 kilometers in three hours, and then we can easily calculate that this has actually been an average speed of 40 kilometers. Sorry, guys. I'm so sad that I told you this one because most of you wrote down here 45. A few of you maybe knew it or could calculate that it's wrong and they ended up saying 40. And what is it actually that I would like to symbolize with this small exercise? Two things. First of all, our brain is so lazy and it jumps to a lot of conclusions based on in actual information false information, a lot of assumptions. This is one of the biggest mistakes in selling. We jump to conclusions based on assumptions and that is so dangerous. And what you see is your brain just telling you 60 plus 30, 90 divided by two, 45, please move on max. No, you're wrong because you didn't get the information. And that's actually one of the first things to learn today. If you want to be successful in selling, you shouldn't believe, you should know. That means you have to get more information that you can base your conclusions on. So please, this is the first mistake. And the reason for that mistake is our lazy brain. You got to fast conclusions. Second part is we still learn something because the funny thing is, if I just took away all the red writing here, and ask you again, what is the average speed if I'm going out with 60 and going back with 30? Then most of you would either answer 40 or you would maybe said, we need more information, Max. Could I please ask a couple of questions? So what we learned now is we learned from a mistake that we can do differently. And we even learned that if I change this one, we have right now actually got a kind of an algorithm that can help us working in sales because what's happening here is if I change this one to 120 and I change, sorry, change here to 120, it will still be the same. That means distance doesn't matter because 60 kilometers, 120, it will still be the same just with more hours, 240. And the interesting part is, if I changed it a lot to a more complicated thing, saying your average speed going out is 79.4371487.9 and going back 28.5159417. You can still use the same algorithm, but it's become more complicated. And what I want to symbolize with this is, if you get really, really an expert in reading customers, understanding customers, and really trying to understand how you communicate with them and their brain with your brain, then you can always handle any situation, whether it's good, tough, or even bad. And with this introduction, welcome so much to the Neuroscience Cell 1.5 in which I'm going to show you how you get the best speed in your way of communicating with your clients, with your customers. And even those of you already, you learn to communicate better with people, human beings outside from your job world, meaning maybe your girlfriend, girl, boyfriend, your wife, your, your husband, your children, or your friends. You will learn to communicate better because you understand what's going on in their brain and what's going on in your brain. The first part here is we jump to easy conclusions. Welcome so much. And just to let you know what we're going to do today, you see here, today we're going to look at our ability to connect, understand, and influence the brain of the customer. As I said before, it could be the brain of our friend, our husband, our wife, our children. It's the same because one thing is for sure, whether we are black, yellow, red, green, whatever kind of nationality, culture, religion, we are controlled by the brain and the brain has the same structure. 
We're not talking about in intelligence and IQ. We're talking about the structure of the brain. It is the same wherever we are in the world. So if we learn to understand the structure of the brain, then we actually are learning. We are on a loving course telling us, I can use this whoever I meet. And most important, I can learn to understand my own brain. So what we're actually going to focus on today is this. We're going to focus on the ability to connect, to understand, and to influence people when we are there. So to do this, we will just shortly start a little with the brain. Maybe this is repetition for some, maybe it's not for others. The brain is a crazy, it's a crazy, crazy thing we have. The brain is actually 1.5 kilos of, 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 of fat and proteins. Nothing but what water and fat. That means 1.5 kilo in our head. We have one reason for having that brain. We need to make sure that we survive and we want to spend as little energy as possible. That's why you, why you jump to these easy conclusions saying 45, instead of trying to be ready to understand, I might ask some questions. You were assuming because the brain is lazy. The brain persists of two, actually three main areas. The first area is the thinking brain. The thinking brain means the conscious part of the brain, the brain that can actually be used for doing just what we did with the, with the kilometer exercise about 60, 30, or 45, or 40. But we didn't think because we jumped directly to the conclusion of the emotional brain, the fast part of the brain, mean the spontaneous part of the brain, that's based on autopilot, assumptions, very fast conclusions. The part of the brain we use most of the day is the limbic system, the emotional brain. And it is the brain that when I ask you a question, you react fast. If I said something to you, what do you think about USA, America? You'll say, yeah, I like it. And then I might ask you a question saying, that's great. What do you really like about it? I might even get you to say, that's something you don't like because I go deeper into your brain by asking questions. So what I get is the first line answer comes from the fast brain, just immediately tells good or bad, or maybe even depends on your style of personality. It might even be that say, yeah, in some ways I like it and in other ways I don't. That might tell me a little about who you are as a person, but if I want to know more about you, if I want to understand more, and if I want to understand to influence you, I need to ask more questions to get to know you. And then when I build rapport, when I build a connection, I can even start challenging you saying, what are the best things you see or the bad things? That means I want to speak to the thinking brain, but the brain is lazy, it's an autopilot, it's on habits. So it jumps directly into conclusions from emotional brain and then I want to wait to connect more and speak with your thinking brain because here we have the conscious part of the brain. And if I want to do business with you, I need to speak with the conscious part, but I need to get through the subconsciousness before. And then we have one problem. If I go too fast and if I go too aggressive, I might activate the third part, the autopilot, or actually what's called the reptilian brain, meaning that if you get too much pressure, you might either fight, flight, or freeze. So my job is to balance these conversations so I can connect to your brain because the brain is built on routines, autopilot, and we are only having the capability of being like 10% of the day awake, awaking day. That means if you are on job like eight to 10 hours, only 10% of that time, you are in the thinking brain. Rest of the time you are in autopilot, you're in the subconscious part. And that means actually, you are not really close to being present in the moment because being present is also here. That means if you're together with somebody, you don't really feel they are there. That's because they lost the, the, the power of being present, being in the thinking brain. And that's natural. We all know it. We are somewhere, we drift away. So what we're going to speak about today is when we know the structure of this, we want to connect to the brain. We want to speak to the brain. And we come a little back to that because I'll give you some tools 
how I actually handle connection, how I actually handle to understand, and how I actually handle to influence, because that is the job we have. But let's start another spot. I know that some of you have seen some of my other live events, and some, for those of you who haven't, then we talk a lot about the changes in selling. And these changes has really been calling for something. And just to let you know, talking about neuroscience and the brain, there's a big challenge here because every change calls for a change in behavior that calls for a change in the brain's way of reactions. That means we have to do something. And today we see sales has never been as complicated as today. It's never been as strange as today. In old days, it was very easy. It was tough, but it was very easy. A sales rep took his bag, took his car, drove out, had a meeting, got a yes, got a no, got a maybe, went home, tried again. That stopped today. So to actually get success here, creating the best possible results, we have to focus on one major thing. And that is actually called CX, the customer experience. We have to focus on the customer experience. And that's interesting because what I see right now is that all these changes has become into changes of structure, into changes of process, into changes of strategy. We are, we are actually starting saying, wow, we need to do something. So we change our strategy. We change our concept. We do something about digital marketing. We do something differently. We sell with omnichannel. We go hybrid selling. We do a lot of decisions on strategy. And there's nothing wrong doing that. But the problem is, if you don't get the human behavior you want, you will never get the customer experience you're looking for. And that calls for something else. Strategy is important, but it's not the only thing you have. Second, what we call for, we call for a change in structure and processes. We try to change the way we generate new leads. We try to change the approach to the market. We try to change the way that customers service themselves and get in touch with us. So what we actually see is we are changing a lot of these processes here. And honestly, what happened right now is just like here, we are defining on paper, we are defining the work and it's great. I'm a big fan of playbooks. I'm a great fan of processes. I'm a great fan of sales structure. But the problem is it might stress the brain of the salesman or the sales organization, whether you're a pre-sales consultant, you're the salesman, you're the, in, in the service uh, department, it might stress our brain. And a stressed brain is not nice to meet. It's actually very unfriendly. So what we are calling for here is, don't stop doing changes in your strategy. Don't stop doing changes in structure and processes, but start also to get ready to build culture. Culture is actually just in the tension field, just in the battlefield of meeting customers. What customers actually see, whether it's from the salesman, the serviceman, the telemarketing, uh, whatever kind of department, what customers experience is they experience people speaking to them, acting towards them, and feel their motivation. So what we talk about here is the head, the heart, and the hand, just in this tension field here between culture and the customer experience. So that means if I want to do a change in my sales strategy, and if I want to do a structure change in the way we have the processes, I do definitely need to do a change in my culture. And that change in the culture will always be the most difficult part because it calls for different ways of doing things. But honestly, what I see today is a lot of the basic skills that salespeople learned 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, they still have to learn for today. They just need to be able to do it faster, better, quicker, and with more quality. So there's still hope for us who've been in sales for more than 20 or 30 years. And we've seen some changes because going back to this, we saw 
in the early stage of, of sales, we saw that people were trained to be, it was a little like we were, the sales guy was the one going out, creating a good atmosphere, making a joke, having a coffee, even going out for dinner. But that changed. And then we became a tough in the 70s and the early 80s. We saw a change in the way we were selling. We got all this Wolf of Wall Street, always be closing, ABC, I'll come back to that in a minute, always be closing, always trying to push, persuade. So we came from the, the salesman as the joker, uh, the storyteller, and then we came in to the persuasion. And then we actually, in the 90s, became much more of understanding the needs, solution-based selling, value-based selling. And what we saw in that change was actually a huge change before sales was a hundred percent man's game. Now we became a lot of ladies, a lot of women participate in our sales because their empathy, going back to the brain, their empathy is much better than the empathy of the man. And empathy is actually in the thinking brain, brain being there, getting the feeling, understanding what's going on. Women, we went down to the emotional fast thinking brain. And instead of being curious, instead of being trying to understand, we just said, I have the product for you. And if somebody said to us, you're too expensive, we just answered like this, quality does cost money. Nobody would ever like that sentence today. So if you're still the one thinking that you have to be fast in your comments, fast in provoking the client, just doing like this, stop it. It doesn't work anymore. So we came from the storyteller to the persuader, to the solution seller. And then what happened today? We needed the business partner. The business partner in B2B selling that understand the client, understand the business of the client, understand the needs of the client and even the challenges of the client. And how can you do that if you never ask questions? Because if you just dump to easy conclusions, sorry to say, nobody wants to speak to you for a long period. Nobody built a close relationship. Try to imagine that you're building a relationship to your friend. And the only thing your friend does, he jumps to easy conclusions or speak about himself. What you have to do here is to understand, to build connection, you have to be more interested than interesting. Meaning that you have to be more interested in the client, his business, him as a person or her as a person than yourself. So here we have a challenge because we are calling for a big change in culture. And one of the changes is this I call ABC. It has been known as always be closing. I'll just tell you to change it a little and then always be caring. Caring for the client, caring for the client's organization, caring for his understanding or her understanding, caring for how they feel. Because if you care, they want to care about you. They want to do business. So if you're still the only one who trying to persuade them, then I can tell you one thing for sure. You will be totally battled out by online selling. Web shops, chat, all that stuff, you're out of here. But if you can change to be caring, you're valuable, you're trustworthy, you're reliable, you build relationship. And that's actually what the brain wants. So if we go into this, we have to take a little look here because what's actually interesting is going back to the brain now, we have to understand if this is the brain of the customer, here, boom, this is the brain of the customer. Then on the other side, we have a brain of the salesman, salesman or woman. The interesting thing is, Structure of the, brain, of the brain is exactly the same. But over here, we have somebody who is always threatened, afraid of losing connection, afraid of losing the order, afraid of losing the customer, thinking of how to kill, so to speak, kill the order, win the order. But instead of trying to win the order, you have to win the trust. You have to win the connection. You have to use other sides of your brain because if I meet somebody who always just jump to conclusions, make assumptions and think they know better than me, I'll never trust them. I'll never work with them. So here you have to train your capabilities. We're talking about what I said, 
Connect, understand, influence. Don't do it differently. Connect is the first part. And what you have to understand here is, in the very, very primary stage of the brain is something called the neuro myron, myro neurons. Myring, myring exactly how you behave. Myro neurons is actually reading your way of behaving. It is done exactly the way I think all of you that have either a horse or a dog or whatever you have, you know that if you do something, they immediately react to your body language. This is exactly the same happening here. The minute somebody meets you, we are actually having these myron neurons connected to the emotional brain and they immediately read your body language. They read how you react, they meet, read everything about you. And what they do is, based on what they read, they actually immediately change behavior. That means if you do something that doesn't seem a good atmosphere, they go on defense. If they think that you're more happy, they get more happy. So what you can do here is actually control your way of uh, going towards uh, doing your prospecting, the way of your body language, the way of your words, the way of your tonality, the way of putting pressure on different words. Here we can actually connect, and we have to connect to that brain. To connect to the brain, we have to understand what's going on in the brain. And to understand what's going on in the brain, I'll jump to another page. We bring this on. So what happened here is I, trans I transplant information here, not only in words, but in language, body language, everything I do, I transplant something over here. That is actually received over here and directly goes into the brain saying, friend or enemy. Friend or enemy meaning that if I can be a friend, I can get them to be relaxed. If I'm an enemy, I'm out of business very fast because we know that the brain is a constantly monitoring is the danger, is the threat, is the reward, is something going on, what's happening? So what we see is, we see that I have to behave well just to connect. I have to read the body language, but even more, I have to make sure that my body language is the right one. So I'll show you here. We talk about threat and reward. When we talk about threat, and we talk about reward, threats, what we actually see is, looking at these threats here, and rewards, we have a system in the brain, research done shows that we have a system called SCARF. SCARF is so obvious that we need to understand because the first time you go out and meet the client, just to connect with them, just to get engaged with them, you have to understand that the customer is constantly thinking on, are you a threat or your reward? Mainly they will focus on you as a threat, but they could do also as a reward. And what they think about is my status. Are you trying to take over for me? Are you pushing me away? How can I actually feel? Do you take my position? So we have to understand that if you are too much, you threaten them. If you're not enough, I will move on because then you might not give them certainty. So the first part is, are you aware of how you make actually the client feel they have the status, they have the position? Second part is they want certainty. Certainty calls for what kind of solution do you present for me? Can I trust that you will come back and be a stable supplier? That's why you see a lot of people don't change the supplier because it's so easy to stick with the one they have. They don't even ask about a price because spending energy changing gives us a risk and the risk aversion in the brain is very, very, very low. It doesn't want to take any risk. So here we have to understand in the brain of the customer, they're looking for own position. They don't want to be challenged. They're looking for certainty. They don't want uncertainty. So you have to make sure that you can meet them and understand them 
because otherwise you will never create that. And if you start saying they have a bad supplier, they immediately have a problem because they decided to do it. So if you tell them, I think you took the wrong supplier, you are directly, not even indirectly, directly criticizing them for their decision. And that means their status is threatened. So never ever do that. Never even say that a supplier is bad. Because if you do that, you make them in the brain understand that they did a bad decision. So we come back to what you can do. Certainty here. Autonomy. People want to have autonomy. If you're trying to tell me that I cannot make my decision myself, I will probably run away. On the other hand, I like to be together with you because I'm more certain in that. So here we see the country, just like good old Maslow talking about the needs. This is a little similar here. On one hand, I want to be the one making decisions. On the other hand, I want to be certain. So you have to give room for your clients to make sure they have autonomy to decide what to do. On the other hand, you have to make that kind of autonomy depending a little on the certainty that shows them exactly what will happen. But never start deciding for your clients because if you decide, then you're taking away autonomy and they'll probably lose patience with you. They'll probably lose faith in you. So then we have a strange one. We talk a lot about loyalty. We talk about a lot about what actually creates a long lasting relationship. We see today that relatedness is a very important thing. What we mean here is if I don't understand the clients are not ready to relate to me in the beginning, they might have a longer relationship and are related to somebody else. These relationships is internal in own organization. It's also external with suppliers and partners. And in the minute I'm trying to get them away from that, they have to disconnect relationship and relatedness is a big part. We all know how difficult it is to tell somebody, I don't like you, I don't want to work with you. So what you put is you put a lot of pressure on these guys here to make decisions to move from one supplier to another. You put them in a position where they can lose status, wrong decision, position is lost. They can be uncertain because certainty, yeah, that's a big one. They could actually be unrelated because they cut a connection to existing supplier. So you have to understand what's there going on. And that means if you just sit down there speaking about your product, speaking about your solution, speaking about your own company, you're trying to impress them. You're going down the wrong alley, my friend. You have to do something differently. You shouldn't be interesting, I told you before. You should be interested. You need to connect with the emotional part of them instead of just being, I'm impressive. Don't be impressive, be really curious and interesting. The last part here is, Maybe the strongest force and driver of everything. Fairness. That's why if you're not transparent in the way you work with your clients, if somebody get a bigger discount, somebody get a better price, unfortunately what happens is I think it's unfair, I get uncertain, I feel bad status, I feel we're not related, and I feel my autonomy has gone away. And what I see a lot of people do, unfortunately, the old school of selling, they're still trying to compete on discount. Give me one example. I had an offer of a product for my company. I asked three suppliers. The first one gave me a price of 2,000 US dollars. The second one gave me a price of 1,500 US dollars. And the third one gave me a price of 1,200 US dollars for exactly the same product. I was a little more, I, I, had a, I was a little fan of, not the first one, 2,000, he was out. I was a little fan of the one for 1,500, but he was still more expensive than the other one. So when I asked him and said, there's something wrong with your price, he just started saying, okay, what price should I match? And then he jumped down, when I said to him, and I was even lying, I said, I got three offers. I got you, one five. I got one, one two. And I got one on a thousand. And then he said, okay, so I'll match the thousand, he said. And remember, 
It was a lie. I didn't even get the thousand. My feeling was from being my fan, my favorite, one five, he jumped to a thousand. In my head came one thought, wow, how low can I get him? So I put a little pressure on him and said, yeah, but you're still not lower than the other one. And now he went down to 900. I closed the deal. I bought it, 900 US dollars. Honestly, I bought the product. I got the solution, but I got no respect for the salesman. I'll tell you a little later what he could have done because if he had tried to make me understand a little more and he had tried to understand my situation, there might be solutions. But what he did here was definitely feeling of unfair because what would, what would have happened if I just said yet, yes to 1.5, 1,500? Would he then just have said, wow, I'm so happy, I cheated him, or oh, what happened? So next time I'm gonna do a deal with him, I'll be so ready because what happened now is my autopilot is all ready for defending. It's so ready to defend already in the beginning. So what happened here is I lost a kind of respect for him. Now he can of course deliver and he can do whatever he wants, but respect for the person, the company, yeah, it's on a, it's on a small basis. So here we actually have to understand don't jump to fast conclusions of lowering your price. You lose all close relationship. You lo lose loyalty, you lose respect. If you're so far away, there might be some changes that need to be done. You could be curious, you could be interested. And that's what we're gonna look into now because we have to get tools to do this. I hope you really understand now, just to summarize, two brains will meet each other. They're the same structure. Everything is going on. They are both on the threat and reward system. They are activated. The customer is activated to understand, don't cheat me. The pain of the sales guy is, don't cheat me. They are both here in that system saying what's going on. We want to connect. And what is interesting here, I'll show you now. We start on the short term and then we build it to the deeper. Actually, the first thing I'm gonna show you here is this one. In the first seven seconds of meeting people, we built a minimum of 11 beliefs about that person. That means we are addressing something the minute we walk into the room. The minute you took a look at my video here at the presentation, you're starting creating beliefs. Some of them I can maybe hopefully change, but some of them are deep put into the brain and some of them are even confirmed and strengthened even, even more. And that means it's difficult to get in touch with you. So to get a good start, I'll just give you some examples of what you can do. Before you meet a client, prepare before. I'm not talking about preparing papers. I'm talking about preparing yourself for the way you act, the way you meet them. That means get ready in your head, not to have a funny joke ready, but to be curious and be present in the moment. I'll just go back here and show you. If we go here, the big problem is being present is in the first part of the brain. Presence is in the conscious part of the brain. And unfortunately, a lot of salespeople, they are not aware of what they're doing. They just jump into a meeting thinking, I've done it so many times. Yeah, but just being unaware means you're not present. So here, let's just start. Be more present in the moment. Smile while you meet people. I see a lot of salespeople, they don't focus on smiling. Smiling is the easiest way to connect. Don't do it too much, don't do it too little, but smile, show them you're happy because they get all these impressions for you. Second part, if you're in that kind of culture, and I know we've been, of course, uh, been challenged a little with the COVID-19, shake hands or whatever is the ritual in that region where you are. Shake hands, take your hands, show them they're there, blow your head, whatever is done, you have to greet them and say, I am here. And what is interesting here is, if you want to be more present, 
you have to work on your breathing. What actually happens when you breathe deeper is, first of all, you get more energy to the present part of the brain, to the conscious part. So breathing is a technique that can help you to be more present. We all know what's happening when we get more stressed, breathing goes to the throat and it gets more rapidly. We don't get a deep oxygen and we disconnect. And it actually also helps us to build a deeper voice. Then you shall. Deeper voice makes more safety, more security, more calmness. And if you can start by saying hello, instead of saying hello, then you're more ready to connect in the mental, in the state of mind with the client. It seems so easy, but I think if you look at yourself in the last 10 meetings you had, you probably had meetings where you just flew in from one side, went into the meeting and were not ready to be present. So actually here is also walk a little slower than you used to. That means you actually now give, as it said on the one, next one, you provide an opportunity for the client to see you. Why is that interesting? Let's go back to the brain again. Going back to the brain, all these signals that we sent to that brain need to be absorbed, put into the brain and jump to some kind of conclusion. If I give them a chance to see me, they'll see I'm open, I'm ready, I'm not an enemy. And that is a very, very important thing to focus on. And then look people in the eyes. Don't stare them down, but just get a short touch of an eye connection because that is a way of saying, I respect you. In some cultures, I know there's one body, there's somebody who is the first one to do that. There's a second one, but we all know the most important sense we have is the sight. 60% of our of information coming from senses comes from the eyes. So please let people see you and see them and show them some respect. Because if you don't even recognize I'm here, I greet you, I see you, they will lose what they think about you. And then what we also is, now we're getting into the position. And now it's challenging because now we go into where should I actually be on the table? Let's just try to see this is the table here. Normally what happens in a meeting like this is, here is the sales guy and here is the customer. Sales guy, customer. That is a natural and traditional way of putting ourselves in a meeting. But going back to how the brain reacts, this is a direct confrontation. And it's a totally wrong way of sitting in a meeting if I want to build good connection, good relationship. So if I could, by any chance, I should go here and put myself in a triangle. Because in a triangle, we are together. And this is one of the small tricks, tips and tricks. If you put yourself there, we are on the same side. You're not on a fight. You're building actually rapport, building connection. So here is a small trick. Try to change position if possible. If you have clients visiting you, you can do this. If you visit them, sometimes it's difficult. But when they visit you, plan it. Don't just do as you normally do. Second part is, let's try to imagine that you have to meet two clients, client number one, client number two, and sales guy. What normal happens here is you sit in front of one of them. And what you do now is you have a direct line of connection, but you're losing connection to the other one. What's actually is the risk here is that you are having a dialogue with one and you're excluding another one. So if you're a little clever here, then just move slightly to be in the middle because then you will speak with two people at the same time. You can do that by moving away a chair, by being in the middle, and then what they will see is the emotional connection. I'm not talking about the content yet. The emotional connection here will be better. So what we talk about here is these small advices, and I'll just uh, jump to this 
one second here, I just jump back. These small advices, we have to understand these are so important. And all of you that want these slides, you'll get them. And also, if some of you really want to learn more, what we are proposing today is that eight of you will get the possibility of having a small workshop, be participating in the workshop. So if you want to participate in that workshop, my partner and colleague, Mark, he will actually just send a link for that form where you can fill out. And if you're the lucky one, uh, you'll be choosing for one of the eight seats in a workshop that you can learn more about this. So let's jump further on because what happened now is now we talked about we talked about the emotional part. We also need now to speak about the content of the communication. And let me show you one example here, because this is really not rocket science, but I tell you, it creates result. What I want you to learn now is, I want you to learn what is called the island mindset. I'll put it up here, island mindset. Island jumping, we all know in the days where COVID had no problem, it was no problem. We could go to Thailand and jump all these small islands and had a good experience here. Island jumping, island mindset. That is actually one thing that is so important for a safe man. Try to imagine here, we have these islands. And what is happening is we have one island here. There will even be a tree here. Here's the sales guy. Here is the customer. Sales guy, customer. When you arrive in a meeting, you are on your own island. You're in your company. You know your prices. You know your profit. You know your results. You know your delivery time. You know everything. The customer is in the same situation. They know their organization. They know their needs. They know how desperate they are. And remember, everything in both of you is actually controlled by scarf by status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, fairness, everything. What you want as a sales guy, you want to jump to a situation where you can actually stand next to the client and be the partner of him or her. That is your dream. Going from picture number one to picture number four, you want to go there. What happened, unfortunately, is that a lot of salespeople jump to what I call Picture number three. It's a good picture, but not as number two. They jump down to where they actually tell the customer, visit my island. They start telling about their product, their solution, their price, their responsibility, their, their, all these references. They just jump to a situation where clients are, so to speak, mentally raped to come to their island. And the funny thing is, what is the most important thing for you in the world? Me or yourself? Yeah, you know the answer. You're more important for you than I am. I am more, more important for me than you are. So what we know for sure is the center of the world for a customer is like 60 degrees around them. But nevertheless, I see so many salespeople, professional salespeople, jumping direct from, I'm so ready to meet you. Let me tell you about my company. I tell you about my solution. But honestly, how can you tell that without visiting with the boat traveling to my island? Meaning that I start going here to see you on your island. This is picture number two, and this is where you should go. And I give you a couple of small trips and tricks. First of all, start framing, telling them what you want to do. Tell them that what I want to do is build an island together with you. How do you look upon this, dear client? Because if you frame that, the client will say, I'm not afraid anymore. Secondly, tell them that you will jump to their island to understand them. And that means you will have to ask a lot of questions to understand them and you will hopefully get information. Don't believe they tell you you're their inner secret from the beginning, but start being curious, start being investigating, start being understanding. 
the more you understand and show you what to understand, the more they get open-minded, you get more information. So what you do is after framing and telling agenda, you jump to their island and you meet them there. You ask questions, you get information, and sometimes you make a small invitation to go to your island and tell them a little about what you've done before. And then you go back to ask how they see that. And then you go down to tell them what you can do. And then you go up to ask what they think about it. And then you'll make like a pendulum. You'll go forth and back here for a long period until you're ready to tell them, now I've been understanding your island. I think I know what kind of solution. Now I've told you what we do. Does that fit with you? Yes, it does. Should we then jump to this one and maybe try to make a common conclusion? This seems so easy. But just think about your own behavior. How often do you actually jump to your own island or even down to a conclusion before visiting the customer's island? And when you get objections, one of your most important things to do is not to go to your own island, not to go anywhere else. That is actually to even visit the island of the customer more. And it starts very easily with these three letters. P, U, F. That is the secret of handling objections. It seems so easy that your brain will probably do exactly what it did in the beginning. It will jump to a conclusion saying 45. But you better learn from that and say, okay, maybe my brain is doing a trick with me right now, telling me that I already do it, but I am actually not if I'm conscious. P-U-F is very easy to understand. P-U-F means you always have to meet an objection positive. Why? Because if you meet an objection positive, the brain of the customer will calm down and your brain will calm down. So that means if somebody is telling you, hey, my friend, your solution is too expensive. Don't start fighting. Don't start telling. Don't tell them that you're quality and somebody's cheating. Just say to them, I respect your comment. That is P. Or just say, thank you for telling me. I respect your comment. That is the P. Always meet them positively. Second, go to the U. You have to uncover what they mean. There's only one way to uncover. And what is that? Asking questions. So what you do here is you say, Thank you for being honest about the price. Tell me a little about what is, what is your opinion on the price? Tell me a little more what, what comes to your mind when you compare these prices. And then even maybe be curious, what do you think about my solution? What benefit can you see? And then you can go to a change of focus, asking them if price was the same, which solution would you pick? Going back to the guy who presented me 1,500, 1,200, 1,000, even going back to 900. The one who presented me one five, I had the best feeling with him. Same product, so to speak, more or less. In case he had handled my price confrontation, like saying, Matt, I'm so glad you're honest with me. Let us discuss a little. What is your feeling about my solution? What is your feeling about the way we do it? I would have said, because he jumped to my island, I'm so happy with you. I feel it's really good. I feel that you understood my need. Okay, what is the value of that? That means I can trust you like that. Okay, so in case price has been the same, who would you choose then? For sure you. So that means I just have to find out why I'm actually on that level. And I think I might be able to go closer to you. But if I do that, I am ready to do a deal with me. You see what's happening now? He would meet me, he will ask me, and I will even say to him, yes, I am ready. Right now, what I feel is he just lowered his price and he even lowered it again. I lost trust. So what we talk about here is you have to learn not only to be good, but to, to be great in communication. Communication is your way to connect, influence, understand the brain of the customer. Question technique. And it's simple. All of you have probably been learning question technique in different sales courses. But honestly, now it's time to be honest for yourself. 
how often do you practice question technique? Okay, I know it. You nearly never do it. So what I could recommend for you, if you really want to get closer to understanding the brain of the customer, to connect with them, to understand what they mean, to influence them, then you should practice your questioning technique. And I can give you one example. If you practice the way you ask questions, open-ended, close-ended, neutral, leading questions, guiding questions, if you practice that five minutes, three times a day, and then let's make it easy, three times, five minutes, that's a quarter a week, it's one hour a month. And then just like say 10 months a year, it's 10 hours of practicing. If you were in sport, you will train much more. But if you just started practicing questioning technique, five minutes, three times a week, you'll train and practice 10 hours a year. And if you went up to 10 minutes, it's 20 hours, that's two whole days. And if I said to you, wow, you're going to train for two whole days. You would say to me, impossible. But is it possible to find three times 10 minutes? Yes. And then we're back to the brain. Because if I give you an unreasonable request saying, I can practice you for 10 hours or 20 hours, you will say, impossible. But if I tell you it's five minutes, three times a week, it's possible. That's what you have to do. You have to make it possible for a brain. So when you meet the customer and the clients, you have to make it possible, you have to make it an option instead of making it impossible. So what we actually talk about here is, we talk about how we can actually connect to people, how we can actually make them understand us, how we can understand them and how we can influence. And there's only one tool to be the best person, that is to understand what's going on in your own brain, because if you do that, you will be closer to understanding what's going on in their brain. So. And there was one asking, what does the U in puff means? Very good question, uh, Louis. Uh, P is the positive, U is understand, uncover, uncover. And then F is focus, change focus. And that is what you have to do, what you have to practice. And I can tell you, I've been training. Now I'm impressing you a little. I hope I don't get too much. I'm impressing you a little. I've been training, training and practicing with thousands of sage people. But what I see with most of them is those who succeed keep on practicing weekly, daily, weekly, monthly. Those who just go for a sales training course, they go with me for two days or somebody else for two days, and then they don't change behavior. Honestly, why should you go on a course not changing behavior? That is waste of time, waste of money. So if you want to do a change, you have to be training constant, constantly, continuously, and you have to be doing it frequently. So that's why we have to understand neuroscience selling is understanding the structure of the brain, but it's even more understanding the structure of your own brain. And one thing is for sure, you have to change a habit, you have to actually replace it with another habit, and that habit you need to build first. So here you have to build a habit saying, every time somebody asks me about something, I never repeat with an answer or repeat with a question. The minute you start doing that, what will happen now? You will be much more understanding than trying to impress them. So I will now close down. So what I'm going to do before I close down is I'll just show you one small picture here. I represent a company called Intense. And honestly, I think you're in a business where somebody else has a product very similar to yours. So you never compete on product. It's not in, even interesting to compete on price. What you have to compete on is intensity. Intensity in everything you do, the way you prepare for a meeting, the way you are in the meeting, the way you follow up, and the way you practice. So if I've succeeded today, I hopefully inspired you to be more intense in everything you do in selling. Then you can change the structure of your brain, and then you can stay you can change the way you connect, the way you understand, and the way you influence your customers and your client. And by this, I just want to repeat, we give away eight seats for a free workshop. I hope you signed up on the form. Mark might share it again with you. And then take care, have a nice day, and see you, and go out there and create intensity. Thank you so much, guys and girls. Take care. Make the world better and with better selling.